My friends, welcome. The mark is here. Iran is set to be the first country to roll out a biometric digital ID needed in order to buy food. Needed in order to eat. Right? Needed in order to survive. You must go get your digital ID from a government. The same digital ID that central banks are telling us are, is needed in order to roll out the central bank digital currencies. The same digital ID that the World Economic Forum establishes is at the very crux of this fourth industrial revolution. Yeah, all of that now you need to go get your ID in order to eat. Now there's some interesting details about the way Iran is implementing this that I want to walk through today because I think this is a, uh, a bellwether for how it's going to be rolled out around the rest of the world. And make no mistake, this is food rationing based on your digital ID. Let's read down here. You're able to buy as much bread as you want, but if you want to get the subsidized prices, then you're going to need the ID. Then you'll have access to, quote, a limited amount of bread at subsidized prices. And you can keep buying the rest at market rates if you want, right? You can buy as much bread for a million dollars a loaf as you want. But for the 50% of Iran that lives below the poverty line, that's not an option, right? Their only option is to go get in line and accept this mark, this digital biometric ID to which all resources are being tied. Not just bread, but according here, the scheme will later include all goods such as chicken, cheese, vegetable oil, and so on and so forth. So this Got
есть что-то прекрасное в заброшенных и полуразрушенных останках былой цивилизации. Это отголоски нашей многогранной истории. Величественные сооружения некогда процветающего человечества, безмолвно доживающие свой век, проросшие зеленью, потрепанные войной и временем, являются отпечатком великой эпохи. Эпохи тех, кто был слишком самоуверен и беспечен, эгоистичен и жесток, кто, к сожалению, или может к счастью, не смог отстоять свое право на жизнь. Hey guys, it's KJ from the Scariest Movie Ever channel on YouTube. This video right here is by far one of the most requested videos I've ever had since I've been doing this here on YouTube. It's all about a new mini-series that came out on the Sci-Fi channel called Childhood's End. Now I wanted to watch the entire six-hour mini-series before I did this video, and I actually finished watching it just yesterday. And there is a lot of really interesting things to pick apart here. I believe the reason that so many of you told me about this show and were requesting a video on it is because you know that I've been covering this subject for years. And that's the idea that aliens, quote unquote, are actually the devil and his fallen angels. It's all part of a deception. I have a whole playlist on this called Alien Demon Deception if you're interested. But this is certainly a subject I've covered for years. Certainly this is a part of the Elite's plan, you can call it the Illuminati's plan, you know, whatever uh, label you want to put on that. But we are definitely being prepared for some kind of alien visitation. And they're setting the narrative now, they've been doing it for years. And I personally believe that when it happens, they are going to sell us these aliens as our saviors, or our space brothers and sisters. So I'm going to pick apart the six-hour miniseries, I'm just going to show you a few things in there I thought were very interesting. But what's most important is we're going to go beyond that. We're going to look into Arthur C. Clarke a little bit as well and his connections to all of this occultism and these esoteric ideas. What's most important, I believe, to understand about all of this is how old this story is. Now, this is from 1953. Childhood End is actually a 1953 science fiction novel by the British author Arthur C. Clarke. And the story follows the, quote, peaceful alien invasion of Earth by the mysterious overlords, whose arrival begins decades of apparent utopia under indirect alien rule, ultimately at the cost of human identity and culture. Another thing we cover here on the channel is Illuminati symbolism, that's one term for it, or a symbolism of the beast system. And what do you see right here on this cover of this book from, remember, 1953? Once again, we have that all-seeing eye, right? We have the beast system eye, the Illuminati eye. It's right there. I mean, this is 50, 60, 70 years ago almost now. We can even look right here. Once again, here's just another version of the book Childhood's End. And what do we have? That's right, more of the all-seeing eye symbolism, the one-eye symbolism, the Illuminati eye. And this is the stuff we're seeing all the time right now in our culture, right? Remember, this is 60, almost 70 years ago. They were putting this stuff out there. And again, you can look at another version of the book. And what is it we have here again on the cover, but the all-seeing eye, of course, with the red and the uh, slit pupil. The timing was very interesting to me. If you look at my channel and see several of the last videos I've done, once again, it's all about them preparing us for this alien invasion or this alien contact, and I believe it's going to be a great deception. And what you're looking at right here, this is one of the main aliens. They call him, I think it was Krillian or Killian, something like that was his name, but they call him the Supervisor of Earth. There's other creatures that look just like this. And of course, this is the stereotypical look of the devil, right? In the beginning, he finds a messenger. This is his messenger right here. That's just one of the shots, but it's interesting. I've also covered mirrors recently and how mirrors can be portals between this world and the next. And even in the show, the way that the messenger is talking to this alien demon is through a mirror. This is the way they contact, is through a mirror. This is the way that they communicate with each other. It's the very beginning of the series. And it's interesting because as the series plays out, these uh, demon aliens are seen as very much godlike. You know, there's crime in the world when they first show up. At one point, a little boy gets shot and killed. And just within moments, you know, the, the rays come down from the spaceship and they heal the little boy. And 
he comes back to life. Everything's good again. One of the most startling scenes in the series is whenever they first introduce the alien, right? And of course, right here it is. The whole world at this point is waiting to see what these things are. They've been kind of hovering above the Earth and spaceships for a while, and now we're actually going to get to meet them. And this was definitely one of the most startling scenes right here, is when this alien is revealed. And of course, it doesn't look like any kind of alien we've ever seen, right? It looks much more like the devil. And here's a clearer picture of it. You can hear Krillian's voice at one point actually calling for children to come up and lead him down. And I know some other people have covered this symbolism as well, because this was pretty crazy right here. But when you look at this, what do you see? Is there anything in recent memory you can think of that, that this reminds you of? Perhaps a statue? That's right, remember the statue right here? This is from the Satanic Temple. And this is the statue that they put up in Detroit that they were hoping to put up in Oklahoma, and who knows where eventually it's going to wind up being. But as I said in the videos I produced about this statue, is this is just the beginning. For the last several years, I've been talking about this stuff, this dark awakening. I and mean, there really is no, an awakening happening. All kinds of people around the world are waking up to this stuff, the darker elements and the lighter elements. You know, some people are growing closer to God, and some people are growing in defiance of him. Isn't it interesting that we have this story? It's a fairly recent, just over the last several months, about this Baphomet statue. And then right here in the show, <laughs> there it is again. It's also very interesting the way that they handle Krillian and uh, the other aliens, if you want to call them that. They're not outwardly evil. You know, at times they actually seem fairly kind, you know, benevolent. I mean, they give the Earth 20 years of complete and total peace and safety, right? All the food they need, there's no more fighting, all that stuff. So, in the beginning, they seem like they're pretty good guys, you know? They're not here to hurt anybody, they're... They're taking care of us. You know, they're looking out for us. Scattered throughout the series is more so-called Illuminati symbolism. Right here is one of them. It was the huge sun theater right here. And I've mentioned this in other videos as well. It's always about the sun symbolism. This goes back to sun worship, the worship of Lucifer. And it can also be used subtly as the whole Jesus is Horus and all that stuff. We're all just worshiping the sun, right? There are a lot of really interesting layers to this miniseries. I'm going to try not to spoil too much for you if you ever actually want to watch this. I was surprised how well made it was, seeing as how it was on Sci-Fi Channel. I always figured Sci-Fi Channel was Sharknado and just stuff like that, but this was actually a really well done miniseries here. So in this story, religion completely dies, and not just religion, but faith in God. And any talk of Jesus is completely out the door these alien beings are truly Earth saviors in this story, and that's the way that all of the Earth look at them, as their saviors. And again, this is a subject I've talked about in a lot of these videos as well, that that is going to be a very real issue when and or if these things actually show up, however it is that the powers that be want to introduce these things to us someday, that millions upon millions upon millions of people will be deceived. The girl over on the left is like the last Christian person left on the world, basically. <laughs> At least that's what it seems like in this miniseries. And she's still trying to fight for her faith. But this was interesting right here. The lady she's talking to on the right is married to the man that became the messenger in the beginning of the series. And she's explaining to the Christian lady that what we have now is better than God. Because in the past, she said, all we used to do was just cry and pray, and it just went to some abyss, is what she said. It went nowhere. God never answered. And now, well now we've got these guys up here in the sky and they're taking care of us. No one's fighting anymore. Everyone's getting along. We have all the food we need. And everything's cool. Everything's great. So we really don't need God. I won't tell you exactly what happens to that girl, the last Christian girl, but I will say that a large amount of the religious community you find out through this miniseries actually just killed themselves. They just killed themselves. Once this all happened, once this alien saviors came down, all of their faith, everything, was just destroyed. So a lot of these people didn't know what to do themselves, so lots of these people just gave up, gave in, and killed themselves. Another one of the main characters is a scientist. His story is really interesting. Again, throughout this, I don't want to spoil too much. You should check it out. But he was a scientist, and he's aware of what this stuff is. He's one of the few people that gets it, you know, that sees that this really is the devil. This is the devil and his minions. And they're all coming in the guise of these alien saviors and being our friends and 
He knows that something bad's coming, he's just not sure what it is yet. And speaking of the, again, so-called Illuminati symbolism, or the all-seeing eye, or the one eye, well, here it is again. There's so many people out there that think this stuff is stupid. Ah, it doesn't mean anything, it's just, ah, it's just, you know, it's coincidence. Guys, this is not a coincidence. You know, once again, here's the all-seeing eye. And what that is right there in the middle is kind of like a Ouija board type thing that they use to communicate with the alien saviors. And this part was interesting here too, because this is when the bad stuff starts happening. You know, in the beginning it all seems great. You know, it's all peace and love and all that stuff. But it was around this time when they started utilizing this machine that things start going a little bit crazy. I mean, guys, this is not a coincidence, okay? I mean. I mean, this is not a coincidence again. Right here, you got the all-seeing eye, right? You got the one eye. Let's go back about 70 years. Oh, look, hey, there it is again. Oh, look, and again. Oh, look, and again. And countless more... And countless more examples you've seen here on my channel and other channels of this stuff manifesting more and more. We see this symbolism everywhere now. So it's interesting here, because as she's doing this communicating or whatever, something happens to her unborn child. She's pregnant, right? some kind of a communication between her using this weird contraption and dealing with these alien saviors above something happens to her i didn't get a picture of it but later you see her giving birth and the baby's eyes as the camera kind of turns away for a second suddenly flicker and change colors so you realize that this is a hybrid baby and this is half human and half them right but it's this whole idea of all these fallen beings wanting to mate with the humans somehow combining their DNA with ours. And then there was a whole sequence right here I want to show you, and it's very interesting. Once again, filled with so-called Illuminati symbolism, right? But here we have the little girl. Now the little girl right here in the reflection, that's like a piece of a mirror, of course shaped like a pyramid with the light behind her. So here you have your pyramid and eye. That little girl right there is the daughter of the lady that was messing around with that machine and all that stuff, right? So we have this little girl. And she winds up being kind of the conduit between them and us. And this girl turns out to be a very powerful being. At one point that scientist is having a discussion with her. And this is that sequence right here. He's talking to her. He's talking to her. And then again, well, here comes more symbolism. He's got this picture right here. And he keeps asking her, what is this? What is this? Where is this? What is this? I mean, what is that? Well, once again, guys, a huge pyramid with the all-seeing eye, right? And as I said, this stuff is not a joke. A lot of people think, ah, it's just, it's coincidence. No, okay? This stuff is being revealed all the time right now. So anyway, back to the show. So he's sitting here showing her this picture. He's asking her, what is this? You know, where is this? What is this? And then all of a sudden, all the computer equipment goes crazy, and there's some kind of crazy energy goes through the room, and everything kind of goes nuts. And the very last shot in that sequence before they went to the commercial was this right here. It was the little girl in a pyramid. You don't see the top there, but it was in the pyramid with the light behind her. And she says, now the end begins cut to black, right? And that was the commercial. And that's when we start getting into what these beings were really all about, why they were here, and it wasn't just to, like, be nice to humans. So this right here is after about 20 years of all that peace and love and everything's going cool and there's no problems on the earth. This right here is the moment where this devil creature tells the world what's really going on and basically he says that the earth will no longer be giving birth no new babies are going to come into the earth and we're going to take all of your children with us now and that's exactly what they do so all the kids all around the world start kind of floating up in the sky it almost looks like a rapture type event and they all fly up in the sky up to the spaceships and disappear even women who are pregnant their babies suddenly are just gone so these things take all of the children, all the new life, off of the earth. And they say, hey, you know, you guys can still live out your life. Everything's fine. We're not going to mess with you. Good luck. And that's it. <laughs> and that's it. So after all the kids are off of the earth, you see one of the ships going away. One of the things I didn't tell you is that scientist had managed to get himself aboard one of these ships, right? So they kind of show you these creatures' planet. Once again, you know, the whole time... The whole idea is, oh, they're just aliens. They don't really go too much into the devil stuff or too much into the biblical stuff. Not a lot. You know, they're still trying to sell it as aliens. But that's where I'm telling you the show's very subtle because they do show you everything you need to know, especially when they start approaching their planet. And this right here is what it looks like. 
and that looks very much like you know, traditionally what some people may say looks like a hell right and it very much is I mean, as you're going through this it's crazy it's, an, it's a huge ocean of fire and brimstone and smoke and it's just not a very happy looking place so this here was near the end and they were kind of having a discussion they find the scientist like I said they don't even hurt him they don't kill him or anything like that they actually say if you want to just live here with us you can live here with us but he wants to go back to the earth you know that, that's where he's from and that's pretty much it that's most of the stuff I wanted to cover with the actual mini series I don't want to spoil anything and tell you what happens in the very end but needless to say you know these space saviors they're not good guys <laughs> they were bad guys they were very clever and it's interesting the way that they just kind of lulled the world into this into accepting all this stuff so whenever we're trying to decipher symbolism one thing I always talk about is you know symbols can mean a lot of different things but it's always most important to go back to the beginning go back to what its first incantation was you know what it really used to mean and then we see over time how it takes on new meanings or at least it sold to us these symbols to take on different and new meanings but still but still that original meaning remains it's the same in a case like this you know, instead of just watching the series and kind of talking about what I saw in there I wanted to go back a little further so let's go back to Arthur C Clarke what's interesting is if you start looking into Arthur C Clarke a lot of very very interesting things start turning up and by very interesting things I mean lots of connections to the occult lots of connections to the esoteric connections to if you will the Illuminati let me show you a few things here this right here is an older news story about the Chelsea Hotel. You may have heard of the Chelsea Hotel. There's all kinds of history there. There's something here that I wanted to show you. I thought it was very, very interesting. Right here it is. You can see right here that Chelsea was built in 1883 and became a hangout for artists during the 1930s. Marilyn Monroe and Arthur Miller honeymooned there and Andy Warhol found his muse. In room 322, Arthur C. Clarke wrote 2001. A space odyssey and as many of you out there already know that 322 is the number for the Illuminati skull and bones society it's just an American branch of this Illuminati and we call it Illuminati you know, but to me once again that's just a coverall it's a catchphrase really for if anything for these secret Satanists all these people all these different groups these secret societies that are involved in that pyramid system are all working towards the same goal and that's a new world order, one world system, right? A one world leader. In the first few seconds of the film 2001 A Space Odyssey, the screen is completely black. And from this, we are to know that we are seeing the obelisk that will appear throughout the film. This all-black screen is the obelisk, so we are in the dark in the beginning, profane and ignorant of the light. The obelisk represents Lucifer, xenophobia, the mysterious, the unknown, technology. The illuminated, quote-unquote, powers of the cosmos, or the fallen angels, have sent this black obelisk where humanity is purportedly at the level of ape. And there may also be double meanings there where the audience, who had at the beginning been shown to be in the dark, is not presented as like apes, you know, dumb, unenlightened apes. This should show the disdain and hate for humanity that some of these occultists actually have. The film's main theme, though, simply put, is human evolution. That may sound innocuous to some of you out there, but this actually cloaks a deeper, darker agenda. An occult agenda where man evolves to become God. Once again, we have that God-man theme we, we find so often in this. And this isn't any kind of an evolution to becoming more like God or like Jesus, not at all. It, it has nothing to do with that Christian sense of redemption from death and participation in immortality or resurrection. Rather, this is more of a blasphemous evolution where man literally becomes a new God. So in the uh, what I call the dawn of man scene, the arrival of the black obelisk actually provokes a lot of fear among the apes. And then we see the sunrise on the obelisk from a very interesting angle and that's what you're looking at right here the meaning of the pyramid without its capstone which is what this is is that great work of the secret societies and Freemasons is not yet complete so here the dark light is dawning on ape to raise him to man in the great myth of evolution one monkey discovers technology which is a bone and he uses it for a weapon and to protect his tribe killing anteaters and 
overcoming other monkeys. The other clan of apes lack the bones and the weaponry, and they lose. So, again, the fittest survive, we are told, in Darwinian fashion. War, then, is necessary for progress in this mode of thinking. Here's something interesting that Stanley Kubrick wrote about the film. He says, I will say that the God concept is at the heart of 2001, but not any traditional anthropomorphic image of God. I don't believe in any of Earth's monotheistic religions, but I do believe that one can construct an intriguing scientific definition of a, quote, God. Once you accept that fact, then there are approximately 100 billion stars in our galaxy alone, that each star is a life-giving sun, and that there are approximately 100 billion galaxies in just the visible universe. Given a planet in a stable orbit, not too hot, not too cold, and given a few billion years of chance chemical reactions created by the interaction of the sun's energy on the planet's chemicals, it's fairly certain that life in one form or another will eventually emerge. It's reasonable to assume that there must be, in fact, countless billions of such planets where biological life has arisen, and the odds of some proportion of such life developing intelligence are high. He believes in other life in the universe, right? He also says, now the sun is by no means an old star, and its planets are mere children in cosmic age, so it seems likely that there are billions of planets in the universe not only where intelligent life is on a lower scale than man, but other billions where it is approximately equal, and others still where it is hundreds of thousands of millions of years in advance of us. So when you think of the giant technological strides that man has made in a few millennia, less than a microsecond in the chronology of the universe, can you imagine the evolutionary development that much older life forms have taken? They may have progressed from biological species, which are fragile shells for the mind at best, into immortal machine entities, and then, over innumerable eons, they could emerge from the chrysalis of matter transformed into beings of pure energy and spirit. Their potentialities would be limitless and their intelligence ungraspable by humans. And that was Stanley Kubrick in his own words. So like Richard Dawkins, God is conceived of in the Bible is just silly. But alien life is reasonable. <laughs> and that's what I see all the time with so many of these people that are against this idea that the aliens are actually the fallen ones. It's this idea that God and all that, eh, yeah, I don't know, that's all kind of goofy. But alien life, sure, you know, sign me up. Alien existence is, quote, scientific, whereas Christianity is fable to many of these people. And this is reasonable and most, quote, scientific because billions of years means life will most likely randomly spring from muck and lightning somewhere else out there. And to me, this is nothing but an absurd gospel all on its own. As St. Paul explained, when men turn from the true God, they inevitably will worship lies and fables, defying creatures and creation, as we see right here with Kubrick's own words. So that was just some of the basics I wanted to cover on 2001, mainly for its connection to Arthur C. Clarke, also the fact that he wrote it in Room 322. I just wanted to show you that this man, regardless of title he's given, you know, scientist, writer, you know, scientist, author, husband, whatever. He's very well schooled in the esoteric. He's very well schooled in the occult. That's why we shouldn't be surprised from this, from childhood's end. Something written almost 70 years ago that we could actually see taking place now in a very real way. Not exactly the way he wrote it, but again, this idea of the aliens coming and some kind of an alien disclosure is not just on the lips of me and other people on the internet or your neighbors and friends or whatever. I mean, this is the Pope's talking about it. The Vatican's talked about it. Our presidents have talked about this. All kinds of people are talking about it. And if you look in your media, we're constantly seeing this idea that they're coming, right? This is major predictive programming. Once again, I believe it's just setting us up, getting us ready for this kind of disclosure. It's very obvious to me. We keep seeing the same story coming up over and over again, these same ideas pushed on us. Oftentimes connected with occult symbolism, the esoteric ideas we see, a lot of the mystery schools, a lot of the Illuminati symbols. We see all this stuff together with this predominant idea of our alien saviors. Well, I'll leave you with that, you guys. Stay aware. Uh, realize the times we're in. Keep your eyes open for things like this. Uh, please understand uh, that you know God is very real. This battle really is taking place. This is a spiritual battle. Thanks for checking out the video, guys. Take care, and I'll talk to you real soon.
each other. Yeah. yeah. See it coming. Carson yeah, joins that. us now. Maybe that, of course, was a clip from Close Encounters of the Third Kind, the classic Spielberg <laughs> sci-fi movie about aliens reaching out to mankind through music. That's right. Guys, a new report out in China could be bringing us closer to that becoming a reality and answering that age-old question, are we alone in the universe? Using the world's largest radio telescope, wow. researchers picked up what they are saying possible signs of life beyond Earth in the form of mysterious electromagnetic signals. They did not rule out possible radio interference. They said it was unlike anything they'd seen before. Mm. When it comes, as of course, we were telling you earlier this week, NASA's looking into the possibility of extraterrestrial civilizations after it launched an investigation to UFOs just last week. Do we, are we alone in the universe? No, Just absolutely no. not. Absolutely no. not. No. No. But I don't, I, don't, be. I don't think they're little green men, though. But I, I think hope not. <laughs> so what do, you, what do you think? I don't know. I think they're just avoiding us. Yeah. <laughs> Did you see that 60 Minutes were all oh, here? Yeah. yeah. When the fighter pilot, when the fighter pilot said they saw something that was weird, that's when I was in. Yeah. yeah. Like I said that was it. Oh, by scientific, no. by scientific measures, we'd be very naive to think that we're. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't we do what they do in Close Encounters? Why don't we get the world's biggest speaker? Yeah. yeah. And point it towards <laughs> the galaxies right. and play like the well, new Beyonce's Harry, new album. Play Beyonce's or Harry Styles <laughs> yes. as it was, really loud to the galaxy, yeah. and uh -huh. see if it comes back. I know because I think they're like we're listening to it too. That's we good. come in peace. Yeah. By the time they get it, it'll be oldies. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's right. Uh, that's that's a good point. That's that was so meteorological of you. I love that. This is a video I, I really wasn't planning to make, but something sort of pushed me over the edge this week in favor of, well, making it. Simply put, uh, I took a photograph that... Well, let's just say something was in it that shouldn't have uh, been in it. I don't really see a point in publishing it because for most people, no amount of evidence is ever enough. They always demand a higher standard of evidence than either exists or can be produced quickly. But that said, let's just get right into it. It's a bit out there. It, it really is. But if true, it, it would would explain a lot. So some people are familiar with the entity known as Lamb, which was something that Crowley invoked repeatedly in what he called the Almintra workings, which were done in Central Park, West New York City, which was basically some things he had worked through using sexual and ceremonial magic, using Roddy Minor as something like a medium. Their whole idea was to effectively create a portal that could manifest intelligences from perhaps other dimensions, other planes, whatever word you'd like to use. Which, interestingly, um, plan it is just plain with a T at the end something uh, I find interesting. Now, it's, it's said that the picture was drawn from real life. It's not known whether the entity called itself Lamb or Crowley gave it the name Lamb. It's only known, really, that he considered it to be interdimensional, which is something that has been known about what people call extraterrestrial. For quite some time, it's been known that well, it's not as simple as being from another planet, at least in most cases, that I, I've researched. It was, if I recall correctly, originally shown to people at something that Crowley had put together called the Dead Souls Exhibition. It was in the same year published as a front piece to his commentary on Blavatsky's The Voice of the Silence with this quotation. Lamb is the Tibetan word for way or path, and Lama is he who goeth. The specific title of the gods of Egypt, the treader of the path. In Buddhistic phraseology, its numerical value is 71, the number of this book. Now that's all Crowley ever really said about the subject of Lamb, at least uh, publicly. 
And that's all that was really known until his disciple Kenneth Grant, who he actually gave the drawing to in 1945, had begun to talk about it in his own future workings. The rift in between the spaces of the stars created by the Alminter workings created a gateway through which Lamb and other extracosmic influences could enter the known universe. Later, this portal was enlarged by a jet propulsion laboratory founder and rocket fuel scientist named Jack Parsons and the Scientology and Dianetics founder L. Ron Hubbard in 1946 which some people consider to have led to something of a monumental paradigm shift in human consciousness. They called their magical workings the Babylon workings, which they considered to be a continuation of Crowley's earlier Almintra workings. The idea was they wanted to take the spirit of Babylon and effectively incarnate it. They were going to try and create a spiritual child, or a child in the spiritual world, and then bring it into this world through incarnation. I think Crowley's exact quote on it was, Apparently Parsons and Hubbard or somebody is producing a moon child. I get fairly frantic when I contemplate the idiocy of these louts. These events took place between January 4th and 15th, uh, the Babylon workings, I mean, specifically. They had apparently made the portal much, much larger, and seemingly, at least according to the legends, could not close it. Didn't know how. Or perhaps were not powerful enough to do so. Which makes Crowley's comments all, all the more interesting.
just heard the poem called The Snake. So I have it. Does anybody want to hear it again? You sure? Are you sure? Okay. So let's dedicate this to General Kelly, the Border Patrol, and the ICE agents for doing such an incredible job. Right. This was written by Al Wilson a long time ago. And I thought of it having to do with our borders and people coming in. And we know what we're going to have. We're going to have problems. We have to very, very carefully vet. We have to be smart. We have to be vigilant. So here it is, the snake. It's called the snake. On her way to work one morning, down the path, Along the lake, a tender-hearted woman saw a poor, half-frozen snake. His pretty colored skin had been all frosted with the dew. Poor thing, she cried, I'll take you in, and I'll take care of you. The border. Take me in, oh tender woman. Take me in, for heaven's sake. Take me in, O oh tender woman, sighed the vicious snake. She wrapped him up all cozy in a comforter of silk and laid him by her fireside with some honey and some milk. She hurried home from work that night, and as soon as she arrived, she found that pretty snake she'd taken in had been revived. Take me in, O oh tender woman. Take me in, for heaven's sake. Take me in, O oh tender woman, sighed that vicious snake. She clutched him to her bosom. You're so beautiful, she cried. But if I hadn't brought you in by now, oh heavens, you would have died. She stroked his pretty skin again, and kissed him and held him tight. But instead of saying thank you, that snake gave her a vicious bite. Take me in, O oh tender woman. Take me in, for heaven's sake. Take me in, O oh tender woman. Sighed the vicious snake. I have saved you, cried the woman, and you've bitten me, heavens, why? You know your bite is poisonous, and now I'm going to die. Oh, shut up, silly woman, said the reptile with a grin. You knew damn well I was a snake before you took me in. Thanks.